Well, my portfolio was down $90,000. So guys, the inevitable 2022 stock market crash is here and it doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. Tech stocks are down, the S&P 500 is down, even cryptocurrency is down. Since the start of this year, I've watched my investments nosedive from $430,000 to $340,000 in just five months. And if you're like me, your portfolio is probably down around 20%. By the way, guys, I'm Hayden. And in today's video, we'll be talking about this 2022 stock market crash, how to not lose money, and whether or not we'll be entering the possible recession that everyone's talking about. So let's not waste any more time. Make sure to subscribe and let's dive into today's episode. To begin, crashes are a great way to tell who can actually handle investing and for those who can't. Now, it takes a lot of emotional maturity to watch your portfolio fall and even more maturity to know how to handle it when it does. Believe it or not, most millionaires are created when markets do actually crash. This is because bear markets create a large transfer of wealth from investors who panic sell their holdings during a crash to those who buy the dips while the market is on sale. They also create a big transfer of viewers to the like button. So definitely make sure to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Now, since 1950, the S&P 500 has had an average drawdown of 13.6% within the year, but usually recovers by the end of the year. Now, over this 72 year period, there have been 36 double digit corrections, 10 bear markets, and six crashes in total. So it's safe to say this is quite a common occurrence and nothing new to the long-term investor. Although those new to the market might think this is the end, I assure you it's not. On average, the S&P 500 has experienced a correction of 10% or more once every two years, a bear market of 20% or more once every seven years, and a crash of 30% or more once every 12 years. This year, we have currently seen the S&P 500 drop as low as 19.96%, only four basis points away from classifying us as a bear market, something that typically happens only once every seven years. Now, given we haven't seen any major improvement yet in our economy, there is a good chance that we will enter a bear market before year's end. The most recent crash we experienced was the coronavirus crash of 2020, which was only two years ago. This makes the likelihood of seeing another 30% or more crash highly unlikely since it's only been two years since the last one. However, some analysts still do believe that it is possible for us to turn this bear market into a crash and even into a recession session. So what is actually causing this correction to happen and how can we not lose money? Well, to answer this, we must go back two years ago to when the pandemic happened. Now, economists believe that uncertainty and fear of the virus caused major shutdowns of businesses, extreme unemployment, and indirectly hurt many sectors of our economy, causing a major stock market crash. This imbalance ended the longest economic expansion on record to date. During 2020, the S&P 500 index had lost 34% of its value due to the pandemic. The federal Federal Reserve's response was to embark on a large-scale program using emergency powers in order to stabilize our bleeding economy. The Feds effectively dropped interest rates to zero and injected close to 3.5 trillion freshly printed dollars into the economy as a way to stimulate growth, known as quantitative easing. They did this through stimulus packages, dropping the reserve bank ratio down to zero, as well as by increasing the balance sheet by buying more assets as well as bonds. They did in fact help though. From its March 2020 low point to early January of 2022, the S&P 500 had actually recovered over 100% in less than two years' time, but our economy was still hurting and bleeding from the same problems, and this was just a band-aid fix. Quite surprisingly, this has also been marked as the fastest recovery in history for the S&P 500, and unfortunately, this is what caused inflation to surge to 8.5% in 2021, a level we haven't seen before in 40 years. Dumping money into the economy mixed with the continued supply chain shortages, labor shortages, strong consumer demand, and a war between Russia and Ukraine is what's causing the surging inflation levels. This is why we're seeing gas, food, housing, used cars, and a whole list of other things explode in price. This caused a whole new problem for the Federal Reserve to tackle that we're still dealing with today. Now, the Fed's plan to lower demand and ease inflation is by making it more expensive to borrow money. They do this by raising interest rates and halting their bond and asset buying. Now, the interest rate I'm referring to consists of when a bank borrows from another bank's reserve if it is short of cash at the end of the day. By law, banks actually have to have a certain ratio of cash on reserve. This has actually been a policy in force since the National Bank Act of 1863, even though we did see more stock market crashes because of low reserves since then. For example, the Panic of 1907, which exposed several of the problems of the National Banking Act of 1863, which among them was that the act actually didn't cover all the banks to require reserve. As if we didn't learn anything from our previous mistakes, the Federal Reserve announced in March of 2020 that they are also reducing 
reducing the reserve requirement ratio for banks to 0%, something that we haven't done in a long time. Now, the aim of this reduction was to jumpstart the economy by allowing banks to use additional liquidity to lend to individuals and businesses and no longer require it as an in-case-of-emergency scenario. The crazy thing is it did work temporarily, but as we can see today, it has had major drawdowns since. Now, raising interest rates is where the Federal Reserve Fund's rate comes in. It's the rate that banks actually charge each other for overnight loans, and this is controlled and set by the Federal Reserve. When the Federal Reserve makes it more expensive for banks to borrow by increasing the federal funds rate, the banks in turn pass on the higher costs to obviously their customers, like you and I. This is why we're seeing interest rates on personal loans, credit cards, and even mortgages go up at extraordinary rates. But Hayden, why does this have anything to do with the stock market tanking? Just because we see credit card rates and mortgage rates speak Become more expensive shouldn't mean that the stock market should fall 20 or even 30 percent in just a couple of months well the thing is when the feds raise interest rates they make borrowing money more expensive for the cost of businesses as well as public and private companies over time these higher costs and less business could mean lower revenues and earnings for public firms potentially impacting their growth rate and obviously their stock values now the biggest factor is tech companies which also dominate the market and make up most of its growth and falls like we're seeing today the growing market weight of big tech in indexes like the S&P 500 have tied the fate of markets to these rate-sensitive giants. Companies like Apple, Google, even Microsoft and Tesla generated over 25% of the total stock market return just in 2021 alone. The problem really becomes that tech giants are extremely sensitive to interest rates. When interest rates rise, tech stocks fall. And when interest rates fall, tech stocks actually rise. This is because the current value of tech and growth stocks rely heavily on their expected future earnings. So when interest rates are falling, like the Fed did during COVID, this made those future earnings worth more to investors right now and vice versa. And that's why we saw tech stocks explode like Tesla right after the Feds lowered their rates during the pandemic. Now, the higher interest rates go, the lower the present value of that company's future earning streams are. Higher interest rates can hurt tech companies with high valuations based on the future profits. Higher rates mean that earnings years from now are worth less today, which is scary to investors. Tech stocks have rapid growth assumptions built into them, which is extremely important. So instead of cash flows that would always be set at $1 million a year, for example, for maybe a value stock, many would have expectations of growing 10% or more a year, 20% or more a year, or even 30% or more a year. This is extremely scary to investors right now that have purchased big tech stocks because when they see their future valuations drop lower, they get scared and they sell off and buy something more or less like value stocks. So my plan to not lose money and actually make money is simple. The first thing you need to know is that even though your portfolio might be down, you haven't lost any money on paper until you actually sell. What you are seeing is only unrealized gains and losses. They don't actually become real until you sell your position. So simple enough, don't sell. Now, my plan to make money during this time, even though it might not feel like it right now, is to be extremely aggressive with investing as much spare cash as I have into the market, specifically good value index funds and ETFs that are on sale at a discounted price. Given that my account is currently down 20%, my plan is to buy this dip. However, finding the bottom in a market and even trying to time the market is not really a good habit to get into because more than likely you are going to get burned somewhere in the future. But what you can do, however, is dollar cost average down. Since it's impossible to know for sure when the bottom will be, we can reduce our cost basis per share by steadily buying more as we fall lower. Now, let's say I bought 100 shares of an ETF with an average buy of $200 per share. So the total cost would be 20,000, 200 times 100. Now, let's say after a month, the ETF that I bought dropped 20% to $160 per share. So what do I do? I buy another 125 shares at a cost of also $20,000. 25 more than the previous time. And the formula we would use is total cost divided by total shares equals our average buy or our break even point. So since I've spent $40,000 total and own 225 shares, the average cost per share would be $177.77. This means that when the ETF does decide to go back up, which it will because that's why I'm buying, I no longer need my ETF to be $200 anymore to break even. I only need it to be $177 and change to a cover. And when we do actually head back up to the previous high of $200, I'll be in profit. Now, since I believe that this correction is temporary, the dip is an 
opportunity to buy shares at a bargain price. This gives me an opportunity I wouldn't normally have to average down and lower the average price of my position. I strongly believe that we are, however, close to the bottom, but there still is a chance for us to fall another 10%, give or take, because we're not out of the woods just yet. But I do expect that when we fall, we should see a pretty substantial bounce at the bottom. Now, the reason I'm so aggressive right now is because we may not see another 20 or even 30% dip again for some time. Like I said earlier, we might not see it for another 7 to 12 years. Therefore, I want to buy my funds at a discount when the market is down than at a premium when the market is up. And don't just take my word for it, Warren Buffett has also been spending big this year. Lastly, with the S&P 500 falling more than 16% year to date, everyone has been left wondering if an end to our pain is coming anytime soon or if we're headed into a recession. Analysts still believe there are lower prices ahead, so much so that we could, however, enter another crash of 30%, which would be crazy to see two years after the previous one. The thing to remember guys is the most widely accepted definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Unfortunately, we're not off to a good start. The first quarter GDP growth for 2022 was negative 1.4. This means if we see the second quarter of 2022 down, then we would be officially in a recession. However, something to consider is during everything that's going on, the White House is still confident of a strong GDP growth for 2022, despite inflation risks. And the International Monetary fund shares that optimism with an estimate of 3.7% growth for the GDP this year. So even if we do enter a recession this year by seeing our first and second quarter GDP down, it's likely that it won't last long and we'll maybe see a recovery in the third or fourth quarter and we'll finish this year much higher than where we currently are today. So guys, that's my plan for this bear market. I'd love to hear yours down in the comment section below. And with that being said, make sure to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm, subscribe, and I'll see you in tomorrow's video. Peace.